All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Martin Wilk. I am working in Hannes Group in SUSE Labs, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Multipath today. Uh, it's a little late, so I, I uh, hope I'll get through my slides. Um, so the, the title of the talk is "What's so hard about Multipath?" Um, and well, you may ask, is it hard at all? Um, this is my perspective uh, as a developer who gets uh, a lot of bugzillas from uh, about multipath. Uh, so I am a little biased here, but at least I think that um, multipath does have its share of. Um, um, ah, hmm? no, sorry. So. It does have its share of bug reports, and um, there are certain reasons for that, and I'm going to talk about that. So the, the agenda is first I will talk about some typical failure scenarios, um, and then I'm going to talk about um, what we can improve about that. And finally, if there's still time, I will have a few slides about um, NVMe native multipath versus legacy device mapper multipath. So when I talk about failure scenarios, these are specific failure scenarios actually, um, failures occurring during boot. If you think about multipath, you may think uh, many things can go wrong in, in fatal situations like a failover, uh, uh, network breakdown, stuff like that, but actually we have a lot of problems in this trivial uh, problem just booting the system with multipath enabled. Um, uh, so um, it should be simple, right? I mean, uh, there are devices, they are reachable via, via multiple paths, and the system should just detect that situation, set up a device mapper, map on top of that, and um, make the device accessible through that map. And of course, on the other hand, if you have devices which have only a single path, uh, we don't want them to be uh, in a multipath map. We want to avoid unnecessary complexity there. So it sounds simple. But um, the first question is, of course, um, how do I detect reliably that two paths actually refer to the same device? And then the next question is, if there's only one path, how do I know if there aren't any more? A path may simply not have been discovered yet. Uh, SCSI device detection is usually quite slow, or often at least. And, um, or a path may be not available at the time when you're booting. That's what multipath is all about. And uh, the difference uh, with respect to other layers in the block stack is that unlike RAID or LVM, we don't have any metadata on disk telling us, hey, this is a member of a multipath device. That's no such thing. So we basically, if we see a device only one time in the system, we have to guess. Um, the detection actually works in a two times two stage uh, um, fashion. Uh, first, um, when a, the kernel generates a U event, um, uh, then uh, multipath minus U is run uh, in the during uh, UDEF rule processing, and uh, that command is intended to figure out whether the device is part of a multipath map or not. So, if multipath thinks that it is, then it sets certain uh, UDEF properties, in particular the property DM multipath device path equal one, and the property system D ready equal zero. The latter is the most important. And uh, later rules are supposed to check these properties, and if they are set keep their hands off this device. Of course, otherwise, if these properties are not set, other subsystems like LVM or RAID or whatever are free to grab the device and do whatever they want. So usually uh, such processes open the device exclusively. That means either multipath or some other process can grab the device uh, and uh, the, the one who comes last uh, will fail. <clears throat> Um, so when UDEV processing is finished for the event, then Multipath D, the Multipath Daemon, receives the completed event uh, through the monitor socket, and it, it runs to similar logic to decide if it should uh, multi uh, add this to a Multipath map, and if it finds that it is a Multipath map path, uh, it tries to set up the map. That is step two. And then 
the same thing happens again uh, once in the initial RAM disk and then again uh, uh, after switching root to the root file system. So uh, all in all, we have uh, four stages where we evaluate with some logic whether a device is a multipath map or not. And that leads us to the error scenarios. Uh, so scenario one, UDEV versus multipath D. Here, in the first step, uh, UDEV root processing, a device is classified as multipath device. But later, multipath D um, classifies the device differently as non-multipath, or it has the same opinion of it about the device, it tries to set it up, but fails for whatever reason. And now, um, this situation is really bad, because this device is now not accessible at all. Uh, it can't be accessed via the multipath map, because that map doesn't exist. Um, but it also cannot be accessed directly, because the UDEF properties are set, which prevent other subsystems from using the device. Now, how can this happen? Um, well, it can be inconsistent logic between multipath and multipath D. You say, well, it shouldn't be the case. Yeah, it shouldn't, but it can happen. Um, it can be because some process uh, ignores system D ready zero and uh, grabs the device uh, nonetheless. Uh, then the basic problem is when we are in step one, multipath cannot foresee whether step two is going to succeed or not. So it's a, a generic problem. And this scenario can occur either during any drama processing or uh, later in the root file system. In the second scenario, evil init ramifest, um, it is similar but not the same. Uh, in the init RD, the device is classified as non multipath. And uh, then it means that some other process, such as LVM, grabs the device. Then we switch root. And now we get a different opinion about the whatever device. We now think that it's a multipass device and try to set it up. Multipath D tries, fails, because the device has already been uh, grabbed by something else. And now, again, similar situation than before. The device is now neither accessible either way. It can happen, or usually it will be the case, that those volumes from LVM that have been set up in the initial RAM disk are still usable. But you cannot set up anything else on that device anymore. So it's usually it's fatal emergency mode. Um, this can happen for various reasons. Uh, most often it's because users have forgotten to add multipath to the initial RAM disk. Um, or be, uh, that can happen, for example, because the user built the initial RAM disk before he activated multipath. Um, or it can also be inconsistent logic, different configurations in the initial RAM disk and later. There are more error scenarios which are not just as vital. Usually in that case, uh, the, the order is inverted. The device is first classified as multipath and then as non-multipath. Um, and that results in a race between uh, multipath D and other processes. And it sort of depends whether that device will come up multipath or not. And that uh, leads to an inconsistent setup. Um, leads to lots of error messages, and, but it's usually non-fatal for booting unless the user has put a, an explicit device node reference somewhere in ETC, FS tab or so on. So like something like dev mapper, whatever, or dev SDX, something. So how can these failures be avoided? Well, uh, by not doing that, uh, by using persistent device names, we all know that. Um, uh, but there is a there is a catch here. Um, Dracut has a, had a preference for device mapper names for a long time. So when uh, there's a device mapper device, it will usually ignore the persistent by you UID or whatever name and use the device mapper device instead for internal and hard coded into the initial run disk. And to, in order to avoid that, you have to set the persistent policy configuration option in for Dracut. Uh, that's uh, a good thing to do in general. Might be considered to do that, make that a, a default in, in SUSE distributions in the future. Um, very important is to keep the bounty path configuration consistent between root file system and initial RAM disk. So rerun Dracut whenever the configuration changes, basically. And 
I would always recommend to enable multipath. During installation, when you install SLES, you get a pop-up, multipath devices detected, do you want to enable multipath? Click yes. It's always the best choice because uh, in the worst case, you get a multipath root file system, which is actually not multipath, but it doesn't hurt that much, actually. Whereas uh, enabling multipath after uh, installation is a good, good way to shoot yourself into the foot. Customers do that all the time. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, last one, uh, we have to be careful when running Dracut in emergency mode or rescue mode, because in these modes, multipath is usually not enabled, and that means multipath will be missing in the initial RAM disk. So it has to be added explicitly. So, multipath device detection, how does it work? Well, I said how to detect reliable that two paths refer to the same device. Yeah, uh, it sounds easy, but it's not always that easy in the in practice. Um, not I'm going to go into, into all the details here and now I'm a little late. Um, you know, assuming that we have. Uh, identify the device. Um, the first thing that Multipath does is uh, blacklisting. We have these two um, configuration options, blacklist and blacklist exceptions. Deviating a little here, um, not everyone is aware of that. The Multipath uh, evaluates certain blacklist proper, uh, criteria in order. First, UDIF property, uh, devices that lack a suitable device, a UDIF property that might be used for device identification are discarded. Then a device node name, device vendor product, and finally, then uh, the protocol. That's interesting because it's new and upstream and also in, in factory. Uh, it's possible to blacklist devices by transport protocol, for example, uh, ATA or fiber channel or whatever you want. And finally, by worldwide ID. So, and Multipath will only consider devices uh, for multipathing which are not blacklisting in any of these steps. Um, so, whitelisting one criterion doesn't help uh, if another criterion blacklists the device. Um, the second step is um, worldwide IDs. Multipath remembers existing maps in a configuration file, etc. Multipath WYB IDs. And once a multipath map has been set up manually by the user or however, um, this uh, worldwide ID will be remembered and in the future it will be set up automatically. One problem here is to keep this file also in sync between the initRD and the root file system. Um, this is basically designed to work with the option find multipath yes, um, where um, the multipath D, when it discovers two paths to the same device, then it will automatically set up the map and remember that worldwide ID and set that worldwide ID up automatically in the future. So, there is a difference between SUSE and the other enterprise distributions around um, with respect to, to the algorithm here. Uh, SUSE uh, typically does is what I call the, the greedy approach. So, that means that every non blacklisted device is treated as a multipath device. So, we don't actually need to do this uh, fine multipath stuff uh, because uh, if we see a device and it's not blacklisted, we uh, create a multipath map for it. Uh, on the other hand, the, the other enterprise, Linux, uh, has an approach based on the worldwide IDs. By default, nothing is set up automatically. Um, user has to create, so set up the map first, and from that time on, it's remembered in the worldwide IDs file and set up automatically in the future. The find multipath option is recommended, but it's not set by default. Um, and in the init ID, it's even more conservative. They, they construct a blacklist which ex explicitly forbids any device which is not strictly necessary to detect the root file system. Neither approach is really optimal. So, just to what what is going on? We find a new device. If it's blacklisted, okay, we ignore it. If it's in the worldwide IDs file, okay, we use it. If we have uh, the find multipath option, yes, and we have two paths, okay, we use it. And if not, if we have only one path, in that case, the SUSE logic would just grab it, treat it as a multipath wise device, whereas the other uh, would um, discard it, say, well, we don't know this device, we can't use it. 
And um, this algorithm has uh, been Im improved um, lately upstream. Um, so the first step is the same. We look if it's blacklisted, but then um, we take another step. We, we take a look whether we already tried to set this device up, and if, that we, if we did and it failed, we leave the device alone. And uh, we can see that by a marker under def shm, which is left by multipath D when it fails to set up a device. Um, next steps are the same as before. If it's a worldwide AZ file, we use it. If it's two path, we use it. So then we come to the only a single path situation. And here we use the, the following idea. We mark the device as multipath temporarily. We call that find multipath smart option and thereby ab avoid other subsystems to, from grabbing it. And uh, we set a timer in system D to check again later. If that timer expires and we still have only one path, we say, okay, we ignore the device. And, uh, but uh, if we detect some more paths in the meantime, uh, we can use the path and it's fine. Um, this new algorithm is in uh, Multipass Tools 077, which is also in factory, and uh, we'll look into adding that into uh, slash 15 server pick one. Um, the big advantage here is that there are no more inconsistencies between the UDF rule processing and multipath D. It's, um, the multipath sees the information from multipath D uh, and vice versa. And uh, that's a big improvement against uh, the um, previous situation. And uh, so it just should just work in almost all situations. There are still some ex uh, exceptions. And finally, uh, the blacklisting by protocol, which I already mentioned, uh, will also be useful, helpful in many cases when you want to blacklist just your, your ZATA disk, for example. This is in a quite okay shape, I think, but it needs more testing. And therefore, I would like to ask everyone who has multipath setups uh, to give this a try and see if it works on your system. It is still not 100% safe, that has to be said. System D ready zero can fail. Only system D really evaluates it. Other subsystems need explicit support that would apply especially for, for third-party software. And also in, uh, in it REA, not all setup steps are, are done by system D itself. Something is done by Drakets in a queue, which doesn't uh, take system D ready always in a, into account. Also, LVM has its own logic, which is different. Um, the multipath component detection in LVM doesn't work really. It works only for already existing maps. Not helpful in the scenario I've been discussing so far. Um, there is a hidden feature that I just discovered a few days ago. It's called, uh, in LVM, it's called external device info source equal UDEV. And it has been hidden. It has been there for a long time, but uh, it seems nobody really has enabled it yet. And it would be interesting to, to do some more research whether that might actually solve the problems between multipath and, and uh, LVM. Okay, uh, time's almost up, but I think I may have a few more minutes, maybe. So, up to a completely different topic, NVMe native multipath versus device mapper multipath. Um, well, in, in the NVMe spec, there is already multipath uh, defined. Uh, um, it has been, the support for that has been in upstream since 4.15. Um, it's also in slash 15. It can be activated or deactivated with a kernel parameter, nvm core dot multipath, which is uh, default on upstream and default off um, in, in slash. And it needs no configuration on the operating system side. It follows a just works um, principle. So um, there's nothing you can do on the operating system side. Uh, every configuration needs to be done on the storage. 
The logic uh, for path selection is very simple. It just uses the first available path, at least until now. Um, recently, the NVMe asynchronous namespace access uh, has been published, and there is support for that in uh, kernel 4.19. It's also going into the recent um, SLES, uh, SLES 15 maintenance kernels. Um, it is uh, similar to the uh, SCSI uh, Alua, so you can, uh, the different paths to a device can have different properties in terms of priority, latency, or whatever, and uh, the host can make um, informed decisions which path to use. Um, yeah, as I said, there's very little in the operating system that you can do about it. Maybe some words about, um, you can, basically, there's no user space tool, nothing like that, really. Um, but you can see the stuff in, in SysFS, and it's maybe interesting to have a look. So if you have um, this uh, multi -path NVMe without multipath, the devices are named by controller instance and by per controller namespace instance. The namespace is what a logical unit is in, uh, in SCSI, for example. There are also subsystem entries in, in SysFS, but they are uh, not really used uh, if you have a non-multipath setup. On the other hand, with with multipass enabled, the subsystem becomes the more important uh, entity. It, you can compare it to something like a storage array or a storage device. And uh, so there's a, so the, the actual block devices are accessible via a number via what is called $S here, the subsystem number, and $N, the per subsystem namespace instance, whereas the controllers. Um, are now secondary instances only, and there are so-called private namespaces, which are also block devices, but they are inaccessible from user space. They are hidden. And there is just one symbolic link from the con uh, subsystem to the controller. That, that's the only connection that you see from, from user space between, uh, uh, between the subsystem and the individual controllers that are used to access the device. Now, um, well, um, customers uh, have been working with multipath tools and device map multipath under uh, Linux for a long time, and um, it works with NVMe devices if, if the NVMe native multipath is switched off. Um, customers have s scripts or have are accustomed to use uh, the tools um, that come with the device mapper and. Uh, well, the, the only disadvantage to use NVMe that way is, of course, the added complexity, the uh, performance overhead that you have. Um, in the long run, it's certainly better to use native NVMe multipath, but it's still quite young technology, and uh, as I said, users uh, may stick to their old habits at, uh, for now. So the idea was to provide at least uh, as a similar user level interface, at least for some parts of the um, functionality. That's only for monitoring. As I said, there is nothing to configure or to change to do um, actively on the operating system side, but at least that. Um, we implemented as a so-called foreign library and multipath tools. Uh, it is upstream multipath tools uh, 7075. It's also in factory. In SUSE Linux Enterprise 15, it's currently disabled. We had some problems there during installation. Um, not, um, but um, the, I think these problems will be solved by Service Pack 1. The uh, support for asynchronous namespace access still needs to be done or evaluated if it uh, pays off to do that. Just an example how it looks like. So if you have a native multipath system, you can use a multipath minus LL yeah, command that uh, people are typically using to see the basic uh, uh, information about the multipath map. Okay, um, yeah. Thank you for your attention. That was all I wanted to say today. So, if you have questions, please use the microphone. Otherwise, I'll probably not be able to understand what you're asking.
Just one. Uh, just wanted to say there is actually in the NVMe CLI there is a command to list the multipath maps for native multipathing. So it's just not the multipath command that our customers are used to. It's a new command. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. No more questions then. Thank you again. Bye.